On behalf of the Friends of the Scranton Public Library Poetry Series, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's reading by Robert Crilly, and to, to tell you, among other things, that our reading is partly funded by a grant from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. <clears throat> in this, our 87 and 88 season, we will have one more reading in the summer, the exact date to be announced, in Cornelius Eady, winner of the Lamont Prize. Um, tonight, of course, we have Robert Creeley, who originally is from Massachusetts, but who has spent significant parts of his life at Black Mountain College, New Mexico, California, Buffalo, where currently he's a professor of English at the State University of New York at Buffalo. For those people who uh, began investigating contemporary American poetry in the early 1960s, Robert Creeley's first major collection of poetry, For Love, was one of the essential books. And a critic by the name of Hugh Kenner has said that Creeley is one of the very few contemporaries with, who, with whom it is essential to keep current. Uh, what there has been to keep current with since the early 1960s, since For Love, has been at least 10 major collections of poetry, including Collected Poems, 1945 to 1975, which was published by the University of California Press. And most recently, a book entitled Memory Gardens, published by New Directions. Many fellow poets have testified to the importance of Robert Creeley's voice in American poetry, beginning with people like William Carlos Williams, Charles Olson, and continuing, continuing with names such as Denise Levertov, Robert Duncan, John Ashbery, Allen Ginsberg, and many, many others. Robert Hass, whom some of you might have seen read a year ago here in Scranton, wrote an article about Robert Creeley, which concluded with this sentence. He is a master, one of the handful at work in America in any art. At this time, I'm very pleased to be able to present Robert Creeley. Thank you. Thanks. It's sort of a hard act to follow. <laughs> They're die happy, as they say. <laughs> um, I thought to, to uh, to, to begin with some uh, one particular poem from way back, thinking for love, read the title poem of that book, and then to 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 bring it forward in so-called time. <coughs> for love. Yesterday I wanted to speak of it, that sense above the others, to me important because all that I know derives from what it teaches me. Today, what is it that is finally so helpless, different, despairs of its own statement, wants to turn away, endlessly to turn away? If the moon did not, no, if you did not, I wouldn't either, but what would I not do? What prevention? What things so quickly stopped? That is love yesterday or tomorrow, not now. Can I eat what you give me? I have not earned it. Must I think of everything as earned? Now love also becomes a reward so remote from me. I have only made it with my mind. Here is tedium, despair, a painful sense of isolation and whimsical, if pompous, self-regard. But that image is only of the mind's vague structure, vague to me, because it is my own. Love, what do I think to say? I cannot say it. What have you become to ask? What have I made you into? Companion, good company, crossed legs with skirt, or soft body under the bones of the bed. Nothing says anything but that which it wishes would come true, fears what else might happen in some other place, some other time, not this one, a voice in my place, an echo of that only in yours. Let me stumble into, not the confession, but the obsession I begin with, now, for you, also, also, some time beyond place, or place beyond Time, no mind left to say anything at all. That face gone now into the company of love. 
it all returns. So that would have been just, I remember when I, this book was first published and I had happy chance to read from it, um, my wife said I began to sound like a museum guide, you know, <laughs> had little locating anecdotes about each poem as you sort of want memory, I think if that was a classic memory lane trip, um, I'll t I won't do that this evening because uh, it, it gets to be utterly absorbing and <laughs> leaves literally everybody else out. But this is a parallel, and uh, this is a parallel in, pro in a prose in a prose collection, uh, as I've written, I began actually thinking I would probably, I intended to be, like they say, a, a, a particularly a prose writer, and um, never substantially got around to it. I wrote one novel, and then wrote a collection of short stories that was before that, and then wrote uh, more recently in the, in the in the 70s, early 70s, uh, a sequence of three, three. Uh, prose patterns of 30 pages each called it, I call the whole thing Mabel a story and it has one section is called a day book and then one part is called uh, presences and one part is called Mabel a story and Mabel a story this particular part of it the end of it was imagined as a various uh, representation uh, sense of uh, response to uh, f feelings about fantasies of all of it uh, of women, and um, this. Uh, no, actually, excuse me, I'm I'm in the wrong place. It's uh, this is actually presences, and there the whole situation of this text has to do with a sadly dissolving marriage. Ostensibly, it's a series of pieces that were done to complement uh, reproductions of the work of a of an extraordinary sculptor, Marisol, Esca Marisol, uh, Venezuelan sculptor, who does these wild, uh, uh, substantial, scaled uh, uh, sculptures, almost look like toys or, or dolls, but they are incredibly uh, uh, powerful as presences, almost totemistic. And so, anyhow, I wanted something that could have that curious projection of people uh, in a very complex and diverse way. This is, this is literally straight narrative. And back to back, these situations of tortured sensibility. Does that mean the sound of fingernails scraping a blackboard? The old proposal of sliding down razor blades on your heels? Or simply the sharpened stick pushed into your eye, tongue cut out, penis slit, fingers crushed, both legs broken at the ankle? Coincident with consciousness, is an ability not only to know things, but to recognize and anticipate feelings, even to propose them, the terror or pleasure in that act notwithstanding, so that the reality so engendered becomes the experience of the world entirely. Angered, outraged, they got on the plane in Chicago. There was shaky agreement in London, but insistent flarings of temper and irritation. Friends put up with them, with him in particular, and at one point, late at night in an alley, retrieved the garbage he drunkenly poured out of the can standing along the edge of the street, while also picking up the clothing his wife, in rage, pulled off to throw at him in rejection. Then Paris, exhausted, quieter, walking again with friends after a brief and confused lecture he had given at the Sorbonne, the lovely spaces and tones of the city, their host's argument relieving their own, and finally, Italy, where they were to stay for a month at a villa in the north on Lake Como, facing across to the Alps in late spring. They were met at the airport in Milan by a car and driver bearing the villa's insignia, and then driven through flat city streets, then fields and increasingly winding roads to the villa itself, sitting above the town on a high promontory so that the intersection of two lakes met at its point. They were greeted by the director of the villa and his wife, introduced to those also in residence, some 10 or 11 men and women, and taken to their rooms. His own outrage was involved entirely with proposal and with, he considered, what he had accomplished, their present situation being its latest condition. He loved her as he had assumed her to love him also. And he had been away, returning with the usual nervous hysteria and demand, to be hopefully comforted by her, his laundry seen to, 
And then he was off again to make more money in a manner he found both egocentrically pleasing and hateful by public lecture. They were to meet in Chicago at the airport. He remembered precisely the table they sat at after he had asked her, obviously expecting no answer to confuse him, if she had fallen in love with anyone during his absence. When she answered in her usual truth that she had, but that it could not work, and that she continued to love him also, he was dumbstruck. A myriad of possible details pruriently demanding flooded his head. He insisted on facts, as he said, going over and over the dilemma of the information in his own increasingly drunken mind until they realized they had missed the flight to London. He called a friend and they went to his house, but the difficulty would not be eased, and they fought there too, himself falling and cutting one wrist on a glass that had been broken in their struggling together. The friend got them to a hospital where his wrist was sewn up by a contemptuous young doctor without anesthetic, possibly to make him feel the ugliness he was exuding. The friend left and after some walking they found a hotel still open and spent the night in a restless attempt to sleep. He was at the villa, ostensibly to write. Both realized that it was markedly difficult to be long alone with each other, and that his obsessively recurrent questions brought them again and again to bitterly useless argument. Two, the privacy necessary to her own life was being battered by his attacks. The alternatives were the other people, of course, but most were occupied during the day, either with their own work with trips out into the surrounding country, which he could not afford for his wife and himself. So he asked if it might be possible to have a small room, apart from the suite given him, in which to work. At one point in the villa's history, one of the militant Swartzes, who then owned it, designed a retreat for his monastic brother in the form of lovely gardens and walks through charming copses of trees, small cells or casetas, were erected at various points along the edges of the cliff for meditation. And it was one of these he was now given in which to work. Its space was roughly six feet square, with a large window extending almost to the floor overlooking the lake. It seemed a small tower of stone and delighted him entirely. So each morning he would retire to the caseta while she went on up the path to the ruins of a small castle on the very head of the hill which the villa occupied. This was encircled with a low wall of stone, and again the view was impressive. At noon he would break off whatever he was doing and go up to join her, and both would wait for the appearance of two of the villa's servants in white jackets, carrying a lunch for them in a wicker basket, complete with fruit, wine, and napkins. Sitting there, it was possible for him to let go of his resentment and to be with her in a way actual to the place itself. He had come to Europe first as a young man, after the war, but only briefly, and then only to England. His group was being repatriated, and while they waited for other priorities to be respected, they sat in a small army camp close to Cardiff. That had acquainted him with the oldness of Europe, but it was a very faint sense. He had been with these people in a war, the most contemporary of realities, and continuing with them elsewhere did not lessen that impact of the present. After marriage, he returned to Europe with his family and lived for two years near Aix in the south of France, then for about the same period in a small town in the Balearic Islands of Spain. His self-conscious use of either French or Spanish kept him from ever really being there as an actual person of the place, but the daily involvement of his family certainly made him common. Especially in France, when he went out into nearby woods to attempt to find wood for a fire, he had the feeling he was walking on ground that innumerable persons had also walked on over and over, making a weight of time he had not thought of as possible. Human life he had begun to recognize as, a, as an accumulation of persistent small gestures and acts, intensively recurrent in their need, if not, finally, very much more than that. The ideas they delighted in or suffered However, however much they did affect the actuality of all, were nonetheless of a very small measure of possibility. Hunger or happiness, exhaustion or the security of home, both the measure and the vocabulary were extraordinarily simple. At meals, he considered, 
somewhat defensively, the facts of their company. He felt nouveau, an upstart among them. He recognized their names as those of an eminent company. One, affable and in no wise condescending, had directed the Marshall Plan in Europe after the war. Another was a markedly famous journalist and spoke very easily of presidents and the worlds they are found in. A third, English, an accomplished historian, had been previous vice chancellor of Cambridge. To him he referred the poems of Basil Bunting, which the older man took off to his room with some interest. But himself, complacently angry and despairingly unable to regain a place familiar to him, was unwittingly awkward and almost hostile. In private, he was both contemptuous and defensive. His wife, as love, had gone to hide her head among the stars. A small brochure given them on a, their arrival, along with details of the times of meals and other daily activities, noted the history of the villa. Its first recorded possession was by Pliny the Elder, who had used it apparently as a farm and retreat from the hotter Southland. Both Plinys make mention of it. Subsequently, it was owned by the Sforzes, previously mentioned and must have remained for some time in their family. Leonardo da Vinci speaks of the view from that ruin where his wife and he ate lunch daily and in his journals remarks that one may see the waterfall across the lake in the small town of Fumietta. Stendhal had been a visitor, as had also Flaubert, and in modern times, as one says, Mussolini, fleeing for his life, had been apprehended as he was trying to reach it. It was finally purchased by the daughter and heir of a wealthy American whiskey manufacturer and then given by her to the foundation, whose grantee he now was. The Kennedys had used it for conferences. Despite the irritation of its administrators, it went on and on. One night after a particularly nattering attack on her, his wife left their room still in nightgown and robe and went off through the interminable corridors and passageways to escape him. He thought to go after her, but at the door looking out at the silence of the dark halls, he could not. Later she reappeared smiling to tell him that one of the eldest servants, an old man who worked as night watchman, had seen her and deferentially offered to follow with his lamp so that she might find her way. How simple the intrusion of factual needs upon affairs of conjecture and assumption. As he sat in the caseta, sunlight flooding the window, the lake far below, what was so adamantly there to be written? Sun bright, trees dark green, a little movement in the leaves. He could hear the sound of a small outboard motor on a boat below him, voices talking, laughing. Best that one's needs be simple because there seemed no true alternative to that condition. No one of those previously to have been here, not the farmer, nor soldier, nor monk, nor artist, nor writer, nor dictator, nor anyone at all were more actual after all. It came and then went. Birds singing measure distance, intervals between, echo silence. I'll read one poem from that rather bleak occasion, but um, The writing curiously made a difference. And I'll read you several. They're just a cluster, not to. <coughs> the poem that that ends with is this one called Intervals. Who, am, who, uh, there's one just before this part of this too. Here, what has happened makes the world live on the edge looking Intervals, who am I, identity, singing, place, a lake, on ground, water, finds a form, smoke, on the air, goes higher to fade, sun bright, trees, dark green, a little movement in the leaves, birds singing, measure distance, intervals between, echo, silence. Water, water drips, a fissure of leaking moisture spills itself unnoticed. What was I looking at not to see that wetness spread? 
Actually, these are very depressing poems, and I just don't see it. <laughs> Forget it. <All> right. <laughs> That's enough of that, folks. We're going to move, moving right along. Um, I thought I spent now about 20, um, over 20 years um, in Buffalo teaching. I came there first in actually 22 years, 1966. And I'd come and, go, come and go a lot, but that's been the basic uh, place that's been home for those years. Um, so not so long ago at all, I was learning to live uh, really by myself again, learning, learning to uh, old-fashioned abilities to take care of myself, how to make a meal, <laughs> how to take care of your laundry, how to stop you know, from going mad, how not to watch television 24 hours a day. <laughs> How to talk to your neighbors, you know, feel an active, old-time social real life. And uh, I thankfully had the, uh, the occasion and agency, really, of teaching. That gave a basic, yeah, that was a basic old-time social, social um, grid or bridge or place to be with people in real way. But then there were many hours and many days when that wasn't the case. Uh, so I was living in an old-fashioned Italian neighborhood in the city on the west side, the corner of Fargo Street and, uh, and Rhode Island. And Fargo is, of course, the Fargo of Wells and Fargo, who start Wells Fargo. And that always charmed me, that that's where the whole Pony Express business of so that. It's a wild stepping off point into the physical uh, west. I was also within walking distance from where I presume uh, La Salle built his boat to go out on the lakes trying to find the, the Northwest Passage, or thinking, literally, he was after the, the headwaters of the, uh, of the Mississippi. But he presumed that that would take him across the continent. So it has a lovely old-time resonance. And the skies in Buffalo, nobody tells you about the skies in Buffalo. They're glorious, like great moving masses of, of, of clouds and, 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 and horizontal. Once, you, once you're west of the, of the Genesee Valley, the whole physical earth changes significantly. Anyhow, <coughs> I was living in this apartment, and the owner was, a, uh, was very generous. The apartment rented miraculously for $70 a month, <laughs> and uh, four rooms, you know, uh, it was over a little old-time neighborhood store, the Castagnoni store, uh, which was great. You hear this incredible energy start up every morning, wild, screaming Italian. Uh, and they were immensely good neighbors. They'd pack a lunch for me when I set out to drive west, for example. Um, prosciutto and lots of, you know, cheap bread, salami, the whole bit. So I wrote a sequence of poems called Later in this workroom that my landlord, Joe, had given me to, to, uh, in the attic of this old building in which I live. And it moves through various senses of, 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 of place, but Buffalo comes. Buffalo, 400 Fargo Street, Buffalo, New York, uh, September 3rd to 13th, 1977. Later, there are ten parts. Later, shan't be winding back in blue, gone time ridiculous, nor lonely anymore. Gone, gone, we thin delights, hands held me, mouths winked with white, clean teeth. Those clothes have fluttered their last regard to this passing person walks by that flat back yard once and for all. Two, you won't want to be early for passage of gray mist now rising from the faint river alongside the childhood fields. School bell rings to bring you all in again. That's mother sitting there, a father dead in heaven. A dog barks, steam of drying mittens on the stove, blue hands, two donuts on a plate. Three, <coughs> the small spaces of existence, sudden smell of burning leaves makes place in time these days these days passing common to one and all. Four, opening the boxes packed in the shed at the edge of the porch was to be placed to sit 
in the sun glassed over in the winter for looking out to the west see the shadows in the early morning lengthen sharp cold dryness of air sounds of cars dogs neighbors persons of house toilet flush pan rattle door open never done five eloquent my heart thump bump my funny valentine six if you saw dog pass in car looking out possibly indifferently at you would you could you shout hey spot it's me after all these years no dogs coming home again its skins molded through rain dirt to dust hair alone survives matted tangle your own changed your hair grayed your voice not the one used to call him home hey spot the world's greatest dogs got lost in the world got lost long ago it's kind of a wild elegy to my dear dog uh, I, one of my favorite books as a kid was bob son of battle <laughs> which <laughs> which was very re encouraging to me folks you know. <laughs> great scott's terrier or whatever, scott's dog hey spot the world's greatest dogs got lost in the world got lost long ago it was Richard Bowdigan who called him the world's greatest dog. <laughs> and uh, seven. Oh, sadness, boring preoccupation. Rain's wet, clouds pass. Eight. Nothing late about the no place to go old folks, or hell, or Florida this winter. No past to be inspired by futures. Scales of the Imperium, wonders of what's next. When I was a kid, I thought like a kid. I was a kid, you dig it? But 150 years later, that's a whole long time to wait for the train. No doubt West Acton was improved by the discontinuance of service, the depot taken down, the hangers around there moved at least back a street to Max Garage. And you'll have to drive your own car to get to Boston or take the bus. These days, call it last Tuesday, 1887, my mother was born, and now, sad to say, she's dead, and especially you can't argue with the facts. Nine, sitting up here in newly constituted attic room, mid pipes, scarred walls, the battered window adjacent looks out the street below. It's fall, sign woven in iron rails of neighbor's porch, elect pat soul. O sole mio, mother, thinking of old attic, West Acton farmhouse. Same treasures here, the boxes, old carpets, the smell. On wall facing in chalk, kiss me, I love you. Small world of these pinnacles, places right up in these houses like clouds. And I've come as far, as high as I'll go. Sweet weather, turn now of year. The old horse chestnut, with trunk a stalk like a flower's, gathers strength to face winter. The spiked pods of its seeds start to split, soon will drop. The patience of small lawns, small hedges, papers blown by the wind, the light fading gives way to the season. Schools started again. Footsteps fall on the sidewalk down three stories. It's man-made endurance I'm after. It's love for the wear and the tear here goes under, gets broken, but stays. Where finally else in the world come to rest by a brook, by a view with a farm, like a dream in a forest, in a house, has walls all around it. There's more always here than just me in this room, this attic, apartment, this house, this world. Can't escape. Ten. In testament to a willingness 
to live. I, Robert Creeley, being of sound body and mind, admit to other preoccupations with the future, with the past. But now, but now the wonder of life is that it is at all. This sticky, sentimental, warm enclosure feels place in the physical with others. Let's mind wander to wondering thought, then let's go of itself, finds a home on earth. Yeah, this book was uh, was a great pleasure. There's, there's a poet I really love who I used a, a, a verse from for motto, like they say, to the book. A poet I deep, deeply recommend, Patrick Kavanaugh, uh, who was an extra extraordinary uh, Irish poet of the, say, the 20s and 30s primarily. Then he survived into the 60s. It's tubercular. It came from a classic sort of poor, uh, you know, classic boggy farm background. But he's a great writer. He has the most delicious sort of down-home uh, um, rhythmic and uh, anyhow, just this is a very good human advice. Uh, count then your blessings. It's, it's almost, it's, I love things that are so close to cliche you can't really tell the difference. Uh, they're so, count then your blessings. Hold in mind all that has loved you or been kind. Gather the bits of road that were not gravel to the traveler, but eternal lanes of joy on which no man who walks can die. He's, he was terrific. Something's a change of pace here. Uh, uh, we were, this was written, Penelope, my wife, and I were first together. And we had, I, pr I promised myself after a lot of chaos that I would, whatever happened, <laughs> as long as I was free to come and go, I would, I would, um, I would, I would take four months from, from usual working and just, uh, just, ha just hang out in some place of my own imagination and just, and just forget about worry and all the rest of it. So we were happily in that situation. A friend gave us a place to stay in all, and I well, had a charming and active library. And in the library was uh, uh, this classic uh, uh, book, uh, Enid Starkey, is it? A uh, um, classic book on uh, on um, on Flaubert. And it's it, to me, it's 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 got that lovely '30s kinds of dry, uh, uh, discreet attention and. Uh, even the greatest of subjects has a curiously dry, equivocal presence in this kind of writing. And necessary to her, to her discussion is some resume of, of Flaubert's early writing. So that <laughs> she's now qualifying the themes of the, or the, or the, the story, literally, of this, of this early work. And uh, she's describing the situation of the hero of an early, an early, some early prose of Flaubert's. I was charmed by the, um, and she means, she's not kidding, this is literally her language, quote, eventually he dies out of a lack of will to live, comma, out of mere weariness and sadness. <laughs> I thought, that's an incredible, uh, sounds, sounds good to me. Uh, but this, this is, the en ennui, you know. Uh, so I used that phrase as the beginning of this poem. <laughs> this is the most boring <laughs> biography of a great man, a great person I think I ever read. Um, Flaubert's early prose. Eventually he dies out of a lack of will to live, out of mere weariness and sadness. And then he is hit by a truck on his way home from work and or a boulder pushed down onto him by lifelong friends of the family <laughs> writes fini to his suffering. Or he goes to college, gets married, and then he dies. <laughs> or finally, he doesn't die at all, just goes on living day after day in the same old way. He is a very interesting man, this intensively sensitive person, but he has to die somehow. So he goes by, so he goes by himself to the beach and sits down and thinks, looking at the water to be found there. 
Why was I born? Why am I living? Like an old song, Sherry, and then he dies. <laughs> Sorry, it's funny, yeah. This was a lovely, I read also another book that I loved. Um, many of my dear friends uh, in writing, or dear friends, period, uh, had been really, really turned on, as they say, by Shelley. And my great hero of that of my youth being Coleridge, I don't I think that was partly it, and Keats. Shelley seemed to me all I could never quite locate it was too 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 abstract for me to quite get located. I was more literal and Shelley's like Mont Blanc, the great poems of his of his writing, uh, would, would insistently use that sort of Neoplatonic idealization. And uh, he was a terrific great poet. But anyhow I couldn't connect. And then I read a uh, a very, very engaging biography in contrast to Ian and Starkey uh, uh, by Richard Holmes, a, a biography of Shelley that gives a very kind of articulate sense of, of what kind of, seemingly what kind of life he did have and what kind of person he in fact was. And there's a lot of unheavy quoting of, uh, of, of, of texts, poems, materials he's writing coincident with the circumstances in his life. And one of the, the, the great, the final poem, apparently, of his life is The Triumph, it's in the, the triumph of Life, this long, curious narrative, uh, um, fa half fantasy projection, a very curious poem. Uh, so anyhow, here we were. And he, it's, he has a poem also somewhat of the same time called Epipsychidion, uh, Epipsyche Idion, uh, Idion. Uh, uh, so Eidolon or Eidion. So I was, I translated that not knowing any Greek, but by foot, from footnotes of the words etymology to, to be myself, Epipsychidion. Myself. What younger felt was possible, now knows is not, but still not changed enough. Walked by the sea unchanged in memory, evening as clouds on the far-off rim of water float, pictures of time, smoke, faintness, still the dream. I want, if older, still to know why human men and women are so torn, so lost, why hopes cannot find better world than this. Shelley is dead and gone, who said, taught them not this, to know themselves. Their might could not repress the mutiny within, and for the morn of truth they feigned, deep night caught them ere evening. I love that. And for the morn of truth they feigned. They were frankly, to use vulgar emphasis, bullshitting. They didn't know any more about it than any of us. For the morn of truth they feigned. New horizon, new frontiers, there's a great new day, um, you know. But for that morn of truth they feigned, deep night caught them ere evening. Um, they had to recognize that they, as all of us, are finite, human, and specific, and there could be no great, expansive idealization possible. Taught them not this, that is all the dilemmas and, and determinations of life somehow didn't humanly uh, d end up with people recognizing the, the, uh, you know, the finite dispositions of their, own, of their own fact, our own fact, and there's this constant proposition of some advantage. I mean, it's, you know, the only advantage that anyone could be presumably given would be three squares a day and a place to sleep in some community that, that, that uh, relates, and all the rest would be more or less of whatever, et cetera. Yeah. In fact, in this last, most recent book, Mem Memory Gardens, I'd taken the title, I thought the title came from a German uh, sort of portmanteau word or something of that kind. I thought we'd spent some brief time in Berlin and then when I came to title this book, or to, I had the, particularly the poem, the, the title poem is a poem from my mother. I had thought that memory gardens was a German expression for a cemetery. 
turns out there is, in fact, a cemetery named Memory Gardens in all, just outside of Albany, New York. And I'm sure there are other cemeteries called Memory Gardens. It's so, so, you know, yeah, kind of, yeah, Memory Gardens would be an appropriate name. But what I, but I hadn't remembered, getting old, like they say, uh, what I had not remembered that the, that the great use of that title, Memory Gardens, was by the poet who lived not so far at all from Albany uh, in, in Cherry Valley, Allen Ginsberg. And the occasion of that title and the poem that, it, that it's the title of is the great elegy for Jack Kerouac after Kerouac died. So um, what I was, yeah, I had, I had everything done. And the book, there was the book, so to speak, hadn't been published yet, but it was all together. And uh, I thought, I didn't want to bump Alan, certainly, or seem to steal his terrific title. But I was damned if I wanted to give it up either. So uh, I thought, what could I fairly do? Well, I could quote, make explicit where the, where the title comes from. And so, and it's a terrific poem. And uh, it also, it certainly emphasizes the feeling of this book or the, the conviction of this book. And just, it's the last verse of this poem, of this elegy for Jack Kerouac, which is Alan saying, quote, well, while I'm here, I'll do the work. And what's the work? To ease the pain of living. Everything else, drunk and dumb show. I believe that. I think the only, uh, the only thing that matters in one's life is to ease the pain of living, to make it, uh, uh, as they say, bright in the corner where you are. And I can't honestly see that anything else is much is really much more interesting. I mean, to uh, to, to 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 try to to diminish the, uh, the the shock and despair that's that seems sadly part and parcel of uh, of of of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a life. I mean, there are moments of exquisite ecstatic happiness, hopefully, but there are all, all, also moments of exquisite <laughs> absolute despair, and uh, who they are. Paradoxically, not uh, uh, both of them are paradoxically very interesting. Uh, if one's thinking about them, experiencing them as something else. <laughs> One thing that's always fascinated me is death. <laughs> uh, being a New England poet, it's hard to avoid. Uh, it's a great tradition in New England. It's about great. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, in any case, I think a great, great poet, Emily Dickinson, who uh, certainly doesn't accept death as the necessary consequence, quite the contrary, but who is endlessly informed by the presence of it. And uh, not at all morbid, but uh, in fact, she doesn't really buy uh, any of the uh, beyond in any very decisive, in fact, she sort of plays, runs numbers on it as an imagination and relief. I don't think, yeah, she's one of the great poets of the imagination of death, uh, what it's like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that fly buzzing in the room. <laughs> this is more ironic. This is speculative and secure. Heaven knows, seemingly never until one's dead, is there possible measure. But of what, of what then, or for what, other than the same plagues attended the living with misunderstanding and wanted a compromise as pledge, one could care for any of them, heaven knows. If that's where one goes, that's simply ironic, yeah, and mean, yeah. <laughs> there's a, there's a, because it's getting close to time. I wanted to read a, uh, a couple of the poems here that have to do with the. We're living actually not far from here at all, up in up in Ithaca, uh, and uh, teaching part of the t uh, spring semesters for two years in, in Binghamton. So I was, I was figuring out about the same distance. I was living about the same distance from Ithaca, from Binghamton that, that that we are now, and uh, it was a lonely and despairing time. And I'd been reading a book by Sherman Paul uh, called uh, Olson's Thrush, Thrust, uh, Olson's Push, not Thrust, Push, and the book is a classic book of a reader, someone reading something and, 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 and getting off on it and being very engaged and stimulated and, 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 and intrigued by the provocations of, of reading. Uh, I don't know if it's simply available anymore, but one of the great books of that order is um, Miguel de Unamuno's great reading of, uh, of Don Quixote. Uh, 
And it isn't that he's explaining anything, he's just, he's reading it, and you get this lovely uh, companionate sense of uh, response to what, what he's reading. It's like having an ultimate friend to talk to about, about, about what, you, what you're experiencing. It isn't that he's right or wrong, or she's right or wrong, it's just it's an endless company in that response. It's a reader's book, not an explainer's book, not a critic's book, a reader's book. And, uh, and I felt that was very true of uh, Sherman Paul's reading of Charles Olson. And uh, I didn't, I couldn't get easily, I didn't have with me the, uh, the collected, uh, the whole Maximus poems. And so particularly the late poems, I loved the le 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 later poems in that volume, that book, including one terrific one that has his relation to uh, Mrs. Tarantino, who was the landlady in the place he lived in Gloucester. He lived on the second floor and she had the bottom of the house. And uh, she had a garden in which these poppies would grow and he suddenly get this wild take on these poppies. We're at that time of year again, so to speak. And they're opening like cigars the, before they unfurl. And the, they also have a wild presence of uh, Persephone, of Corey under, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the kingdom of death, et cetera, et cetera. So I quote this in Come Poppy, When Will You Bloom? And there are two poems specifically involved with, uh, with, with, my, with my father and mother. My father, I never factually knew more than subliminally, at least that's the way I'd put it, since he died when I was so young. And he's buried in just outside of Boston. My mother this is there too, so this is a very specific physical place where they are in Watertown. So fathers has to do with the burial site of both my grandfather and another lot and my father and this one. This is the whole mail trip. Fathers scattered, a slant, Faded faces, a column, a rise of the packed, peculiar place to a modest height makes a view of common lots. In winter, then, a ground of battered snow crusted at the edges under it all. There under my father's, their faded women, friends, the family all echoed. Names, trees more tangible, physical place more tangible, the air of this place, the road, going past to Watertown or down to my mother's grave, my father's grave, not now this resonance of each other one was his, his survival only, his curious reticence, his dead state, his emptiness, his acerbic edge cuts the hands to hold him, holds on, wants the ground, wants this frozen ground. Then memory gardens had gone up to, down, or across, displaced, eagerly, unwitting, hoped for mother's place in time for supper, just to say anything to her again. One simple clarity, her unstuck, glued deadness, emptied into vagueness, hair remembered, wisp that smile like half her eyes, brown eyes, her thinning arms, could lift her in my arms, so hold to her, so take her in my arms. And then I think as things are getting sort of late, I'm going to read a little bit of more recent stuff and let that be the end. And if, what, if we have questions or anything like that, I'd be pleased. Uh, you know, why do you do this? And <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Doesn't... I love, po I love writing a poetry specifically because it seems so unaggressive in relation to materials and uh, to, the, uh, to the way it, uh, it, it depends upon the body politic. Yesterday I was in a conference of, of, of called Critical Poetry's Radical Address at Buffalo. It was very, very interesting. And the, uh, there had been an active discussion by two, uh, by Jack Clark and, uh, and Don Bird. Don Bird having written a substantial uh, book uh, on Olson, uh, on Olson's work. And uh, Jack Clark having done an extraordinary book uh, in relation to Olson and Blake. Not so much a description, but a, from, from, I think it's called From Feathers, Feathers to Iron. It's a remarkable book, a uh, series of lectures he then made as a book. But anyhow, uh, both men were wittingly or unwittingly, I would say, uh, projecting this, this uh, substantial presence. And uh, 
there is, it's true that Olson is presented quite insistently as, a, as a, you know, as this six foot eight person, man. That's for openers. Uh, so he's not a, he's not a, um, he's an, he's almost a prototypical uh, macho or big man. And uh, anyhow, he's, he's a very complex writer, much as, uh, as one would expect. It's his graphing recognition and location of a whole perceptual uh, informational pattern that's fascinating. His conduct at times is as irritating as I'm sure mine is, or probably anyone one knows. Uh, and in some cases, he's stuck with it, or seems to have it as the cultural fact of the time. Uh, he doesn't, I think if you were to ask him, if you were sitting here, uh, what he feels or felt about women, he would presume that he loves them, that they are dear to him, his daughter was dear, whatever. But in fact, the, if you read the, read the poems, you get an extraordinarily uh, distortedness and very violent and at times literally uglifying, uglif uglifying uh, disposition dumps on them, as they say, dumps on the person's qualified women. Uh, and so Susan Howe, a poet of immense respect, wrote, she wrote an extraordinary book also I would much recommend called uh, My Emily Dickinson, published by, uh, by uh, uh, gosh, what do they call uh, North, uh, anyhow, it's, it's uh, North, not North Point, I confuse it with North Point, North Atlantic Books. Uh, publishes of Susan Howe's Emily Dickinson, which is a fascinating book. It's a, there are aspects of this whole uh, expectable discussion, sometimes argument best trying to locate how women can, I was telling David for that it's no matter what one feels or says or thinks about these things, if one's a parent, let's say, this is my, my immediate instance, you have a four-year-old daughter who's uh, suddenly saying, I'm just a girl. You know that the world relating is somehow dumping or confining her. I mean, they don't have to be very bright to recognize that that's a, an, an immense discrimination for a four-year-old person to feel that she's, quote, just a girl, unquote. But it means that the information that's coming to her socially or, or otherwise, either from us, I don't frankly think it's from specifically, or we're not, you know, hear what I mean. Anyhow, it's coming in the world, TV disposition of how, how, she's, how she's engaged. She's a very forthright, spunky person, so it's not her, she, not her, she's not demure or trying to imitate the, but she realizes that, that she comes a cropper at that edge of judgment. And um, anyhow, so what am I talking about? Uh, talking about world, I guess. Uh, Song, what's, what's in the body you've forgotten? <laughs> this is a good question. You can answer this, hand in your answers as soon as this is over. What's in the body you've forgotten and that you've left alone and that you don't want? Or what's in the body that you want and would die for and think it's all of it if life's the form to be forgotten once you've gone and no regrets no one left in what you were. That empty place is all there is. And if the face is remembered, or dog barks, cats to be fed. And this, this one has to do with, a, uh, with a, an emerging theme in the work of, uh, of, of Jim Dine, uh, the painter who would use uh, uh, almost ritualized or, or, or fetishistic images uh, that weren't hokey or, or difficult. They were quite explicit. The heart, for example, a classic Valentine-style heart, uh, would be a persistent image in his work. Or for equally a robe, a classic bathrobe, uh, that was a persistent image in his work. He would paint it in a great diversity of ways and locations. Would be a, so it became a theme. or, or quote, subject. And let's see, what else he had? He had tools. His, uh, his family had been involved with the production of hardware, and so tools had this fetishistic, uh, obsessional information for him. And he did tools endlessly as a context or content. And let's see, what else? He had hearts, uh, tools, um, um, robes, 
then there's then he got involved somewhat a little bit later. Trees began to have these hierarchies. This is when he's about in his 40s, or getting into his early late 40s. Trees became extraordinarily present, sort of blasted huge trees and in, in, in almost like Gothic trees. And then gates, this great hierarchic gate, a specific gate echoed endlessly. And then in this last, not this last show, he had one not long ago at all, but the show just previous, suddenly this death's head, this kind of Renaissance skull was there. And I remember he generously had sent me a copy of the catalog. And on the outside cover, you see this kind of charming Jim's playful sort of numbers with just color blobs. But here cut out is this death, you open, you open up and there's a death's head looking right at you. It's almost like those old movies where the loved one is you, you know, close up and you see the whole skull, the death peering up from be behind the, the person. Uh, anyhow, this is a, so I wrote this poem on the, on the catalog. I didn't, s I haven't sent it to him yet, but save it for Christmas. <laughs> 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 I would have known you anywhere. Back of the head, hand, the hair, no longer there, blown, the impotence of face, the place no longer there, known you were going to be there. You were a character of dream, a mirror looking out, a way of seeing into space and impotent emptiness I share. This day we spoke as number, week, or time, this place an absent ground, a house remembered, then no place, it's gone, it's gone. What is it sees through, becomes reflection, empty signal of the past, a piece I kept in mind because I thought it had come true. I would have known you anywhere, brother, known we were going to meet wherever in the street, this echo too, I would have known you. It's not, it's not, it's not addressed to Jim Dine, it's addressed to this alas poor Yorick, this skull. Um, Anyhow, something, try to end with something less, less grim. Here's a, the last poem I've really, of any substance I've written, is one, uh, I had what is a sobering situation, uh, uh, I had a fistula, which I don't, this is really a bummer, it's a kind of imploded boil, but instead of, say, finally coming to some kind of a head and, 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 and draining uh, does this, then encapsulates again, and then goes deeper, so the infection keeps tunneling. And uh, the, on the only practical way to deal with it is to core it, really, you know, to reverse. <laughs> I could show you my scar, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's uh, in characteristically in your ass, which is not a comfortable place. So uh, I had this terrific, uh, good, uh, weirdly good-natured doctor who's, who seemed Chinese-American, but whose name was Barrios. That interested me. And uh, so um, I'd come up to, I thought the thing had healed up. I thought I'd, you know, had, had some heavy antibiotics and it seemingly drained completely. And I was assiduous in the sitz baths it requires, et cetera. So I thought I finally got it together. And the doctor is going to take a look, say, terrific, you're great, you're healed, go forth, and the whole bit. He said, no, no, it's still there. Shh, you know, there it was. So uh, he then had to enter something like a rotor rooter uh, <laughs> up my anal, <laughs> up into my intestines, the, the inner me. So, uh, so you're in a kind of, yeah, women, again, women must experience something equivalent to this anytime they have a pelvic uh, examination. Only this time you're turned around. You can't, you can't face your accuser. <laughs> That's uh, so you're in this kind of, yeah, like a st stirrup chair, only back, just your face forward instead of the other way. And uh, you ha you're having a, 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 a tube fed into your intestines that permits the doctor to see. And uh, he's checking out the condition of your, of your anus and your, and your intestines. And while in that situation, certain thoughts occur to you. <laughs> <laughs> so this will be the end. <laughs> he made a beautiful moment uh, at one point. There's a quote in the poem where I said, well, how does it look? He said, it looks OK. He said, well, it's, it's, he said, he said, it's fine. It looks, I mean, your intestines look fine. He said, of course, they're like, uh, they're, a, you know, 
places. He said, like an old worn out inner tube that look a little, <laughs> you get bulges here and there, but you know, nothing, 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 just age, that's all. <laughs> Anyhow, talking of age, most explicit, the sense of trap as a narrowing cone one's got stuck into and any movement forward simply wedges one more. But where, or quite when, even with whom, since now there is no one with one quite quiet, English expression quite, language of singular impedance, a dance, an involuntary gesture to others not there? What's wrong here? How reach out to the other side all others live on as now one sees the two doctors behind one in mind's eye probe into one's anus or ass or bottom behind one. The roto-rooter-like device sees all up, concludes like a worn-out inner tube, old, prose prolapsed, person's problems won't do, must cut into, cut out. The world is a round but diminishing ball, a spherical ice cube, a dusty joke, a fading faint echo of its former self, but remembers sometimes its past, sees friends, places, reflections, talks to itself in a fond, judgmental murmur of olden times and ways and wine, women and song, alone at last. I was so close to you I could have reached out and touched you just as you turned over and began to snore, not unattractively, no, never less than attractively, my love, my love. But in this curiously glowing dark, this finite emptiness, you, 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 are crucial. Hear the whimpering back of the talk, the approaching fears when one may cease to be all lost or rather lumped here in a retrograded, dislocating, imploded self, a uselessness, still talks, even if finally to no one, talks and talks. It's less, yeah, that's, then I don't, no, these poems are not remarkably happy. They're not, frankly, all simply involved with self, self despairs, but um, in some pe sad fact, for instance, the, uh, there's, a, there's a Michael Klein is a man in, in Brooklyn is collecting poetry in some hopes that there can be a public reading and there can be a, some kind of public publication, the profits of which will go to, to fund uh, uh, support for those uh, affected or uh, infected with, with AIDS. And that whole situation is immensely dis, 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 displacing and painful. And um, again, uh, thinking of, well, anyhow, you know, I don't have to rehearse for you the whole political dilemmas of our time. Uh, and a plague, I wrote this poem apropos. When the, when the world has become a pestilence, a sullen, inexplicable contagion, when men, women, children, die in no sense realized, in no time for anything, a painful rush inward, isolate, as when in my childhood the lonely leper pariahs so seemingly distant were just down the street, back of drawn shades, closed doors. No one talked to them, no one held them anymore, no one waited for the next thing to happen, as we think now the day begins again as we look for the faint sun, as they are still there, we hope, and we are coming. Thank you. That's it. I'm going to quit. Yeah, sure. That'd be fine. If, there, if there are questions, I'd be pleased to talk to uh, whatever interest. Yeah. Anybody got? Yeah, please. Which, yeah, let me, it's in here, presumably? Because I've used that title a lot. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think I know the one you mean. Um, 
it's three. I think I know the one you mean. It's uh, three twenty-eight million. I I wanted so ably is that my the world. I wanted so ably to reassure you. I wanted the man you took to be me, to comfort you, and got up and went to the window, pushed back as you asked me to, the curtain to see the outline of the trees in the night outside. The light, love, the light we felt then, grayly was it, that came in on us, not merely my hands or yours, or a wetness so comfortable but in the dark then, as you slept, the gray figure came so close and leaned over between us as you slept restless. And my own face had to see it and be seen by it. The man it was, your gray, lost, tired, bewildered brother, unused, untaken, hated by love and dead, but not dead for an instant saw me, myself, the intruder, as he was not. I tried to say, it is all right, she is happy, you are no longer needed. I said, he is dead, and he went as you shifted and woke, at first afraid, then knew by my own knowing what had happened, and the light then of the sun coming for another morning in the world. Yeah. It's a kind of weird true story, but it's not. The provocation was, uh, Charles Olsen said, you know, it will have some several causations. It's, it's, it's always seemingly deceptive to give explanation, you know, the, in terms of how it came, how it was provoked as a poem. You know, the classic book by John Livingston Lowe's on, on, called The Road to Xanadu. It's one of the great, so the great detective stories. But when one finishes it, and, it's, and it really is an extremely engaging and, 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 and interesting book, there's not the least uh, conviction that this is necessarily the way, <laughs> the way that, that either Coleridge was provoked in the writing of, uh, of the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner and or uh, Kubla Khan. You know, in other words, it's a great web of supposition, uh, and it is, but it's immensely circumstantial evidence. So that what I'm trying to say is that how things come to be uh, to be said, you know, I mean, you could say that poem the pl called Plague, that, the, uh, that my imagination of the isolation of people presently, uh, uh, yeah, afflicted with, with AIDS in the social community might be in some ways parallel to the people of my uh, childhood who were, th who were classic lepers, uh, physical lepers, the, leper co the imagination of leper colonies that there was an extraordinary exclusion. Or the, remember that the 30s uh, still had the senses of quarantine and isolation and uh, preventative medicine uh, that also led to coincident social attitudes that you, uh, some of them benign, but also some of them par paradoxically more questionable, that you, by, you isolated and separated uh, more, more determinedly than you probably would do now. There was much more fear of infection and anyhow, going back into criminal, I was thinking of reading a book called The Far Shore, the English imagination of how you dealt with criminals, uh, e.g. <laughs> since you couldn't just take them and throw them into the sea, you threw them as far as you could in some, e.g. Australia, you know. Uh, anyhow, things of that sort. So anyhow, the point is that uh, you might find, one might argue some literal coincidence of that kind, but in fact, I don't honestly know where these things come from in some didactic sense and have only the ground of the, of the provocation at best, but couldn't, uh, couldn't, couldn't be didactic at all. There's no explanation that I can offer. Although, in that, as I say in that poem, has a, there's a specific person, there's a specific moment. So as though I was writing the story of what happened, but it's, uh, I don't know why it happened. I don't know anything about it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Anything? Yeah. Anybody want to get home? <laughs> so why Please. do you do this? I like it. I like it. 
I like it. It's fun. It's uh, it's um, it has a lot of the pleasure that uh, that, that music must have uh, as a uh, it. Uh, it puts me. It gets me. It gets me places in mind I had not uh, thought otherwise to, to to get to. I never thought of them, so to speak. Uh, so it gives me configurations of thinking I would have no other easy way to manage. But but it's playful. It's really playful. It's uh, it's. I mean, as I was thinking, reading, I was hearing a lot of uh, a lot of. Uh, Sound echoes. There's a rhythmic bass for me very often. Other friends have different dispositions of locating for the for the progress for this for the, for, for the activities continuing. But for me, it's primarily <coughs> rhythm, sound, and rhythm. That gives me the the, the place to be, and uh, so it has a lot of kinship, in, in fact, with dancing or with with music. Uh, and what I'm saying can obviously have a specific and particular, and very particular emotional or, or information of emotional or other order that's very specific. But paradoxically, it will be it will be uh, it will be largely permitted or provided for by the rhythmic and, and sound patterns that I that I can. It's a dance. It's like uh, Robert Duncan said. It's like feeling some readiness to take a walk. Or, or Olson qualified it, in, uh, as I understood him, as saying how to dance sitting down, you know. But it's a physical dance. It's not a metaphor. It's physical. You feel dancing. You, I know people I've lived with over the years uh, uh, would, would say characteristically, uh, the characteristic of me would be muttering or talking, uh, talk, singing along. You, if you listen to Bud Powell playing piano, for example, there's always a, you can hear him you know, singing along, humming along with the music as he's improvising. And I love to, I love to, I hear it all. I hear it. Or Duncan's great qualification, you can't remember whether you read it or wrote it, you know. <laughs> and so it's a, it's, it's playful. And it comes from nowhere and presumably will, will return there too. But it's, uh, <laughs> but, and so human. I mean, words have no, uh, have no other occasion except humans. Uh, humans' experience of them. Dogs don't particularly. Dogs will howl when you play music they don't like, but they won't really make much impression with language, unless their name occurs or something, you know. <laughs> but I mean, the point is, it's entirely human. It doesn't. It's not a physical object. You don't have to give it a physical event other than sound. And I like the extraordinary way it uh, it um, it uh, echoes and resonates over time and carries the information of particular collective living. Uh, it's fascinating that way to me. Language. Yeah. And when did you first start doing it? Uh, it's hard exactly to, to remember. Uh, I had a sister four years older. As I said, we grew up in this little farm town. My mother was the town nurse. Uh, I remember having real appetites for reading that she had both my sister particularly prompted and, and, uh, and helped me with. And not just told me to read this, but it would, the library, et cetera. And so I was reading a lot. But I don't recall, I was wanting to be a veterinarian. That was what I thought to be. And uh, when, it came, when I finished high school, it was, I, went to, I got the scholarship to a boys' school. That obviously made a difference because it gave me a much more, uh, you know, much more sophisticated sense of reading th than I would have got in this old-time, uh, you know, farm town high school where only, you know, one or two kids would possibly ever have any education beyond it and would probably go into occupations of farming and or all the town's otherwise activity. But reading and writing would not be their particular interest. Uh, so already I was in, in, I was in, in trouble in the social world at that place because I, I, ha I didn't have that interest. I didn't share that interest with many people. So the school I went to was immensely useful. I went as a, as a sophomore in school. And then came time to think about college. I'd lost this eye, and I had an insurance settlement that had gave me effectually the money to go to college. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was not, you know, an eye for <laughs> an education, but it, it. My mother had. I guess it was like making the best of a bad, of a bad deal. But she had committed the money to my education, so there it sat in this sum until it came time to go to college, and it basically provided. But anyhow, I used that to go to the school, which was my imagination of the Jude, the obscure sense of the great school of teaching of English lit and all that, which was Harvard. Growing up 20 miles away from it, it was intensely the case for me. So that's where I went. 
Uh, and I began writing in that time, just at the end of high school and in, in the beginning of, uh, of college. And I was writing as I th mostly interested in prose. So I had friends in that time, for example, the poets I have as friends in that time are not, rem the prose writers are much more determined. I mean, I knew Willie Gaddis then, but the particular friends were Jack Hawks, John Hawks, and, was, and also Alison Lurie was a close friend. The only poet that I really knew then, uh, as I remember, that would be commonly known now would be Kenneth Koch, and I knew him very little. Although I sat literally separated by one chair from John Ashbery, we never met. <laughs> we were both very shy. We'd go Ashbery, Berlin, Creeley, with a, his friend Buddy Berlin sat between us. <laughs> and it wasn't, I didn't meet John Ashbery until uh, years later, I guess in the 60s. Yeah. Remarkable. Hmm? Remarkable. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I remember my mother saying with absolute good humor, uh, I'd like to think Bob could get a job if he had to. <laughs> uh, so there was no sense of the writing as this terrific thing you're going into. There was a lot of family dismay when I seemed to do that. And I'd married very young at 20, uh, a, a girl I'd met in college, who had, uh, whose mother had died when she was seven. And she had, therefore, a trust fund that her mother's estate had, had given her. It wasn't, it wasn't a, it was like $215 a month. And we married, and we lived on that primarily. I do, did farming in a small sense, but it was primarily that base income that permitted us to get by. So I really used all those, I used from 20 to 28, the length of the marriage, I really was using the time in this really writing. You know, I was writing all that time which seemed very selfish. There's a, remember there's a moment in my life we were living in New Hampshire. must be about the sixth year or, or, or fifth year of our marriage, and I've been writing intensely. I'm now out of college, et cetera, et cetera, and nothing seems to be really working. I remember one night in despair taking everything I'd written and going to this great drum stove and just throwing it in. That's very salutary, folks, if you want to <laughs> see whether you really... Uh, <laughs> really want to write, you might consider taking everything you've written and burning it <laughs> and seeing how you feel of tomorrow. <laughs> it isn't that it was, I wish I hadn't. I mean, it's like putting your hand in the fire to see how much it hurts. It just, I don't think it's a, but it's, there was a time when the accumulation of the writing and the impedance I felt in not being able to get it out, having no basic readers or no means to publish it, was getting so, so frustrating and becoming so analytic. I mean, it was better just to cut forget it and, and uh, start all over again, you know. Uh, and I was to try to, yeah, it's mean it with absolute seriousness and conviction, but, it, but one wants to live also, you know. Because I had children and wife, and uh, it was becoming obsessional. You know, that possibly know that, that what now seems in retrospect this incredible um, correspondence with Olson, that's my part in that. He's, He's corresponding with at least two other people in the same manner. We haven't even got, we start in 1950, I think. We have, by volume 12, we would have got to 1954, you know. <laughs> uh, it took something like six, five or six volumes to get through two years. <laughs> um, it's an incredible, that's a lot of writing in that. And that's, it's letters, I mean, constant flow of letters. So that was a way of uh, almost a, not, but just keeping an information practice going. Anyhow, any more questions anybody got? Uh, on a more informal basis, those of you who would like to stay for wine and cheese that we have and books that we have for sale and further questions, perhaps, uh, <coughs> I'd like to invite you to stay. Incidentally, I said in my introduction that uh, 